Grace Hahn, Director of Admissions, is going to cover a completely different funding opportunity. It's called the SEPA Continuing Student Scholarship. And that's a, a separate um, fund, a separate application, is a, a different criteria, different deadline, a uh, very different thing altogether. So let's start. Uh, so first, I just want to mention the different types of positions that we have. Um, starting with the teaching assistant, should, uh, TAs basically they're, they're responsible to um, help the instructor manage the class with administrative work. Administrative duties would be things like uh, setting up uh, AP support, uh, working on the syllabus, putting, posting uh, assignments online. But in addition, they're also required to do um, uh, help with the instructional support. So this means things like uh, holding office hours, attending the lectures, reading recitation sections, grading, answering student questions, and things like that. The salary is $12,000, and the service commitment is 20 hours a week. Uh, so next we have the reader positions. They basically do exactly the same thing uh, as the TAs, with the exception of reading recitations. So they do not do that. Um, and these are, uh, we call them officer appointments, they're instructional positions. And that means that uh, you, don't, you won't be required to submit timesheets. Basically, every two months, you'll receive a paycheck for the, uh, the salary amount. Um, okay, so then we have these uh, other positions, the program assistants for faculty. Uh, these are the positions for the different programs, the concentrations, the specializations. Uh, these are more administrative duties, and so you expect to do things like uh, uh, set, help with setting up events, uh, managing student communications, uh, you know, whatever you need to do. Um, the salary is the same, and the service commitment is 200 hours a semester, which averages to around 13 to 15 hours a week. And it's the same for the coding systems for the offices. These are um, the, uh, the Office of Admissions, OCS, OSA, uh, similar duties. And then lastly, we have what are called uh, course assistants. These are administrative um, positions that are tied to a course. Um, so you would be expected to, uh, to have administrative support, but you won't be expected to do instructional work. So you won't be expected, for instance, to, uh, to grade or to hold office. Um, okay. Oh, by the way, we'll have plenty of time afterwards for questions for Q&A, so, um, so you can hold your questions to the end. Uh, so we have basically, there's going to be two separate applications for the two different semesters. For the fall term, we're basically going to open up that application today. Uh, we'll have one week to complete the application, and then we'll notify you of the result in the April. For the spring, um, we'll open up after spring break. We'll also get one week, uh, and then we'll notify you in June. Um, the reason, by the way, for the spring timeline is that we want to be able to give the faculty um, your, your final spring semester grades so that they can make a, a, a better assessment. Um, okay. So, who is eligible to apply? So you're able to apply um, you must, uh, if, you, if you have good academic standing. And what that means is that you have a minimum of a 3.0 GPA. And also what's really important is that you, you have to be enrolled in residence at SEPA during the time uh, of, the, of the semester of your award. So, for instance, if you apply to the School of Social Work and you were going to take SEPA courses next year, but you were officially in residence at the School of Social Work, uh, and you were awarded the citizenship, you would have to uh, decline it. You would have to not to take back that citizenship. Um, okay, so, so, how, so what do you do uh, to apply? Well, we have the application. This is just a section. Um, First, we'll see that there's a job description link. Basically, the faculty, they will post 
the, the positions that are available with a description of what they're expecting, if there are any special requirements. For instance, if you want to be a team for Paula Valenti, you would see that she uh, expects that you uh, have taken her course and have gotten at least an A. So you can look at the positions that are available, and then you choose, you can choose as many positions as you want. Uh, you te uh, technically, you can select all the positions, uh, if you want. Um, and then you, uh, you submit an application. So what happens after you submit it is that the faculty will receive a list of all the students that were interested in the position. They will receive information about you, your GPA, your concentration, your specialization, your resume, and they will send us a ranked list. Uh, what we will do is that we will assign each position a randomized priority number. So with this priority number and the, the ranked list, we will then make our uh, assignments. So for instance, if, if Paula, uh, 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 she would get her first choice if that student was not already selected for a position with a higher priority number. If that student was already selected, she would get her second choice, and so forth. And uh, we do this in stages. So the, the first stage is that we make all the TA selections. Uh, and then after that, we remove those students from the pool, and then we follow with the, the next stage, the readers and then the PAs. So it's really important that when you make your selections, that you go by the guiding principle that you're willing to accept the offer, if you're offered any of those positions that you select. Because if you're offered a position and you decline, basically you would have removed yourself uh, from eligibility from all these other categories, and you won't be uh, offered a, a different position. Now, uh, what's not on here are the course assistants. Uh, we have about 40 uh, courses that, um, that you will not apply for, but that you will be automatically considered for as long as you submit an application. Uh, we, we handle those positions slightly differently after the fall and spring application. Um, uh, the students that are still available, we send that list to the different faculty and then we make the, the selections. And then we notify uh, those positions later then. And so. so what happens after you submit the application? Um, you will get an auto reply message. Uh, the email will list the positions that you've selected, so you'll have a, a record. And this is really important. You won't be able to change your selections after you hit submit. So make sure that you uh, have already made up your mind in terms of what positions that you want before you hit submit. And that's basically it for the citizenship part. And now, uh, Grace. <coughs> continuing on uh, for the uh, academic year of 2018-19. Okay. Um, so if you're interested in applying, uh, the application will be live in concurrent with the assistantship application. So you will have, you will receive a link. Uh, make sure you look at it. Um, it's a little different in terms of the deadline date. You have a little bit more time to complete the application, uh, but definitely make sure that you submit the application as well as all the required documents that we're asking by April 2nd if you are interested in being considered for this uh, scholarship. Uh, we are asking students who are interested to submit not only an updated resume, but also your Columbia transcript, as well as a personal statement. And you'll see the question on the application. Um, now, we will ask as well uh, for some financial information. 
so we'll ask for your income in 2016 and 17. Uh, we'll ask about your household size, uh, as well as your current assets. For a domestic student, uh, you will need to make sure that you follow your FAFSA. Uh, so be sure to do that uh, in the appropriate time frame so that we can review your application. Um, so the awards range between five and 15,000 per year. Um, it is uh, similar to the admissions philosophy. Uh, we will be using a holistic approach to reviewing each application. Uh, and what that means is that we're going to look at your academic performance as well as your professional potential uh, while emphasizing need as a component of this application process. Um, the review process itself won't begin until spring, so after your spring, 2018, uh, spring 2018 grades have been submitted, so we're going to take that into consideration, uh, so make sure that's uh, in there and you do well this semester. Um, and then uh, all notifications for those who are recipients of this award will be notified to them by June. Um, now, in order to be eligible for, to receive this award, if you're selected, you need to be a full-time student in residence at SIPA and maintaining a, a good academic uh, standing. So uh, keep up the good work. Um, and so that's it. Uh, I think we're going to have Eric, uh, Dean Burgess, uh, talk to you a little bit about why we're making the switch this year uh, to a continuing student scholarship. Uh, yeah, here. Hi. 
Uh, are you awards for the fellowship uh, for semester or just one, like once? Just continuing student fellowship? Yeah, or are they student fellowship. It's, for the year? It's for the year. <laughs> but if you are here only for a semester, you will only receive for that semester. You're not going to get a full package for the year and then bundle Okay, I'll sort of rotate around. We have time. There was another question. No, that was okay. Yeah, in the back. Um, if, if you were uh, appointed a TA ship, would that mean you'd be less likely to get a fellowship? Are they interconnected in some way or the other way around? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, the, the, the idea is that it's going to be a holistic evaluation like admissions where need is going to be taken into account. And so to some extent, if you have a generous, if you have, say, like two TA ships, and you're getting paid $24,000 doing it for two semesters, that may affect the committee's sort of assessment of how need you work. Right? So it could, I, I guess the answer is it could. I don't know if I have any other way of saying that. Uh, people will look at the thing, they'll try to figure out, you know, a, how deserving, B, how needy, and they'll do a count. They'll try to sort of rank, rank uh, applications and, and, and go down in that order. So that's something, uh, you know, that's something I guess to, to, to think about. Um, back up. Yes? Okay, so um, my question is, there are two different applications, one for screen and one for next fall, right? Um, for the job and just Yes, yeah. and they're going to consider our grades for this semester as well. But I, re I remember that on the dates, they appear March. So I don't know if it's like March 23rd. If you that way, um, they wouldn't be able to take our grades so right now. It's probably May when we're trying to so show. So like like on, on the next application, not for spring, but for fall. For, no, not for fall, but for spring of, of the uh, yeah. Sorry, so your question is when you're applying for the spring semester? No, for and fall. The spring, for, for the fall? fall. Yeah, the faculty will. For the spring, sorry, for the spring, yeah. So for the spring, the, the faculty will, in fact, um, uh, have your uh, your spring and fall grades before they make the assessments. Even though you're applying in March. But it appeared as March 23rd. Right, so the, the deadline for you to apply oh. is, is, is in March, but the faculty will not make the decision until after they receive your grades. I think I understand uh, the reasoning behind uh, redirecting funds to first year students uh, when it comes to the selecting the uh, salary from fellowships. But at the same time, for us who want to apply for uh, these positions, I mean, for, let's take the TA shit. The highest amount is 12000 but in reality, we're getting seven to $8,000 if we're paying 30 to 40% uh, of taxes. I mean, I don't understand why not give us uh, accredit that amount as a as a as a tuition fees credit rather than pay the, pay a salary because we're losing a lot of money from that. <laughs> Secondly, uh, part of this again is we are we want to emphasize need in our scholarship decisions. We cannot use need uh, in these assistantships in the same way because, uh, frankly, one of the most important criteria is, is the person going to be effective in the job, not are, are, are they needy or not, or what's their financial situation. So again, we are we're disassociating the assistantships, the jobs from this aid package, so we can, again, add aid as a factor across all of our decisions. So this is a follow-up. Follow uh, so the money that, that is redirected, is it need-based, or is it... Uh, well, generic? yes, so in, all, so in all of our scholarship decisions going forward, uh, we have a first-year entering student pilot. Uh, this continuing student aid is, uh, it's not need-based entirely, meaning it's not just who is the neediest, it is a combination of the holistic review of the candidate, as well as an assessment of their, their needs. Another follow-up, sorry. For us who, who, who joined in 2017, um, we haven't necessarily benefited from the, uh, the redirected amounts of funds for the first-year students. So for well, us, actually, so actually that's not true. We awarded uh, many students, uh, uh, as I think uh, you mentioned, a number of students received packages, enhanced packages for their second year. Uh, and 
from, from this aid. And again, the SEPA Continuing Student Fellowship is another opportunity for second year students to receive this aid. What were those based off of? What, the, what was the, the decision based on? Year. Holistic review of the student. So, the, like, I just don't understand because I didn't get it. We are, we're not, uh, unfortunately, I don't think we're ever going to be in a situation where 100% of the students will buy or going to get aid. Yeah, but I mean, holistic is so vague. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. We reviewed the student's academic and professional potential and made a decision based on the information provided there. I mean, the, the, the criteria are the same as the admissions. Yeah, the criteria are the same as the admissions criteria. Are people score high on the admissions? Your scoring that's done, we're also the ones who consider primarily for fellowships. Uh, okay, I have two uh, here. So, just to clarify, for the continuing, then, then you, so you said that the continuing scholarship is also has takes into account merit, but is need based, whereas assistantships have to do with the uh, individual preferences of professors. So, then why are they bundled, and why is that? Why getting a TA ship is also considered when you're awarded the scholarship? Yeah. They should be separate. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So we are unbundling. That's precisely I mean, the argument we gave is precisely the argument for unbundling the fellowships from the from the from the assistantships. Right. And then the question is just in what sense would the whether you get an assistantship affect whether you got a fellowship. Right. And there the there it's only because the, the, the fellowship committee is going to try to take into account need. Okay, and your ability to pay for your SEPA education. Okay, and so that to the extent that the fact that you have a job at SEPA affects your ability to pay may play a role in the decision about how need. Okay, but that's that's a very indirect connection. That's that's the true answer. I know I can say it, but there's no answer. Yeah. yeah, it's it's more of just a comment. I think what you're describing, I think, makes sense from like a rational basis, and we articulated that. But for those of us who did enter in the 2017 graduating 2019 class, that wasn't message to us when we applied to the program. So for those of us who are on uh, taking student loans to be here. You know, and now that this, you're, you're sharing that there was extended need-based aid for our applicant-applying class and we didn't know that at the time, it, it really does factor into our planning for the finances of our education. So that being said, I just feel like it's kind of an unfair process to our class in particular, what you're doing, mm -hmm. yeah. and it would be really helpful if, you know, this maybe would be applied to the incoming class this fall, as opposed to us affecting us this particular this year. Yeah. I'm happy to have other people come up and <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I, I'm sympathetic that the message didn't get out as well as it should have uh, in August 2016. Sorry, it's been on the website, so that, but the question is whether everyone would like to scrutinize the website when they're applying. And I understand that not, not everyone does. So it's a question about, so I'm sympathetic about that. And the, this student continuing fellowship, right, is, is a large part an attempt to address the present issue that you're raising, right? This is a new thing. You realize we are saving some money. You realize that this cohort is in a is the first cohort to go through this process. Hence, you know about half the money that we're saving will be given out now in this in the form of this. But that being said, just a quick follow up on that yeah. is your the salary aspect of the uh, assistantships is actually going to be lower now than it was going forward. So that that's why it's it's less money that we are being given access to as our our class in particular than previous years. No, no, but I, but the total amount of fellowship funding for this class for this cohort will be the same. But some some has been given out already, and some will be given out in the form of the taxable income piece, which is less. Yes, so there's the taxable income piece, which which back already spoke 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 to, right? So that part we're trying to clarify that these are jobs. There's very there's a number of reasons why it's important that we clarify that these are jobs. Among them that you know, students are undergoing into process of unionization, right? Where it's been unclear in the past whether these are jobs or fellowships, and so we're trying to clarify to that that they're jobs. So that's part of the. I understand there's a tax consequence to that, but that's part of the part of the motivation. Um, yeah. Here. <laughs> So the jobs do not do not have health insurance apart from the, the sort of what's available through Columbia. There may be, I mean, on, I expect there to be ongoing negotiations between the student union and the and the, and the university about benefits, um, and so we'll wait and see what happens. But the university is not coming to the table. Yeah. So I well, I don't want to get involved in the you know I'm not I'm not involved in the university's policies around the health dealing with the, with the union, but that's just to say that from the senior perspective that's what's that, you know at some point that will that will happen. It's not going to happen at SIFA this next this next year. Uh, over here, yeah. Um, yeah, in regards to the uh, TA positions and the reader positions, 
questions with the payment structure coming down to supplement the fellowship. Will the responsibilities and the obligation of the role also decrease commensurately? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, it's going to be the same. Why? Why? I mean, why? <laughs> So, uh, what I, what I, I'll go ahead and say this. What I think what I would encourage you all to do is calculate the hourly rate that's associated with these jobs. Right? And think about what a fair hourly rate Think first thing in your head about what a fair hourly rate would be for a TA. Then calculate what the actual payout hourly rate is going to be under the, under the new salaries. Okay? And I'll, I'm going to have done Please describe also why some of the TA shifts now have turned into reader positions. So, for example, for a course, for many courses this semester, a person is getting $20,000 bundled payment. Now, a lot of these courses have been changed from TA shifts to reader positions for the next incoming fall semester. So, an immense amount of students that were getting, say, $20,000 for a course this semester, for the same course, for the same amount of work, they are now getting $6,000 of taxable income. That is a substantial decrease in the same amount of work that they are doing. Okay, Ken, I'd like to first finish my answer to the previous question, and then we'll go to the second question. Okay, so the answer to my previous question might say is I encourage you to calculate what the, what the hourly rates are, go through, think about what a fair, fair rate would be, and then calculate what they are. I think, uh, my sense is, and I've actually been out, it's been a long time since I've been out, the student, but when I was a student, forty six dollars an hour would sound even that you know is a reasonable amount of money, um, and so that's the that's the basic answer is that when you think about these just as jobs, they're, rather, they're still relatively generous, even now that the fellowship is involved. In okay, that's the basic answer. The answer about the, the question about we are in the process of the reform. We have been doing some modest reassignment of uh, of positions to courses. Okay, so there's some courses, for instance, where they had a TA, but the TA was not teaching the recitation section. Don explained before that the only difference between a TA and a reader is that the reader doesn't teach a recitation section, the TA does teach a recitation section. So that was, I understand that that was beneficial to the person who was assigned to be TA, that they don't have to work for as much, they don't have to teach a recitation section, and they still get the compensation that's due to a TA, but that doesn't, there's no logic to that from an, from an organizational or institutional perspective. And so it hasn't been a massive number of students, it's been a modest number of classes that have been assigned. Uh, it's not making, going to make a huge, amount, huge difference in the life of Can I just follow up on that briefly? Okay. Because so a lot of the courses, say for example, quant, you have TAs and you have readers. And the readers are the ones who grade the homeworks, and the TAs are the ones who do the recitation section. For other courses where there is just one TA involved in the class, they grade the papers and they have office hours. So they're still doing the responsibilities and they're holding office hours and they're leading the class, they're helping to lead the class. So they're doing different things. I don't understand that there's no support for the one TA for the classes that have, say, two TAs and two readers, why now you're changing that all of a sudden. I'm one of those students that's going from 20 to 6. That's why I'm saying that. So that's not changing within a student. I don't, I don't actually understand what, you're, what, you, what you mean. The 20,000 for this year, now you're talking about assistance at business next year. There's no student who's been assigned a position for next year already. So it can't, it can't be applied to, to one person. Right? So that's, I'm not understanding that. The question about whether it should be a DRA or you know, whatever, you know, it's now called reader position, what you should call DRA versus TA position. That's a decision for SEPA to make in consultation with the faculty about what the appropriate sort of way to allocate our resources across classes. I, that's not going to, that's not changing massively for you all. It doesn't really affect this, the rest of this discussion. And I think it's somewhat a distraction from main issues. I understand there are many issues that are arising, there are serious issues about how you finance your SEPA education. That, I don't think, is, is, is one of them. Yeah. If you're considering doing the Joe degree abroad, how should you approach the time to the invitation? You still, should you still apply like everyone else? And then if you do go abroad, then they can send a replacement for you? <laughs> yes. So, uh, so as mentioned, you, if you're not sure, then yes, so please apply in case you change your mind or you have, you know, you're not sure what you're going to do. But to just to uh, repeat, repeat to reiterate, you do have to be here physically uh, at SIPA and be registered in residence at SIPA um, next year at the Term of Award. Um, how much will it be for um, TA and readers after tax? Like, what is the actual amount? Okay. So, so people's tax rates vary a lot. Many students are not paying very high tax rate. Some people will be paying high. And the personal, I mean, the entire tax structure in the United States is undergoing some changes. 
Um, <laughs> I don't know if people noticed, but uh, my understanding is that the personal withholding is going to be $12,000 next year.